Now, a new departure for young scientists. For the first time since the programme began 15 years ago, we've this year accepted entries from individuals. And the first one is coming up now. This film takes us to Derby and a very young scientist from Ravensdale School. This is Jeremy Skirchley. But Jeremy's not here for the trains. He's not a train spotter. He's a bulb spotter. This is one of the most interesting bulbs in my collection. It imitates a, a candle flickering. It's used on chandeliers and that sort of decorative light. <coughs> in it is a gas called neon. The gas is, when it's off, is at the bottom of the lamp. The rest is filled with an inert gas called argon. And when it's switched on, the heat created in between the two plates which make up the flame causes this gas to rise. And as it passes the flame, it glows and gives this red light. And then it gets to the top, it cools down, and it drops down again and passes the flame where it glows. And it continues doing this as well the lamps alight and causing this flickering effect on the surfaces of the metal of the flame. Well, I was four years old when I got my first bulb and it went in the kitchen fire and my mum said I could have it. Then on the same day, a bulb went in the reading lamp. And from then on, various friends have got me bulb, a lot of bulbs and now I've got 500 in my collection. I think they're amazing things, really, because you flick a switch and you get light. This bulb is one of the biggest in my collection. It's a high-pressure mercury vapour lamp. Uh, I got it for a pound, they're normally £26, a shot worth throwing it out, really. Uh, it's used in a football stadium for football floodlighting. This is a standard circular fluorescent light and I don't like the break in it. I think it's ugly and a lot of people have said it is. It's really the same as a straight fluorescent light bent round. Now, I've always wanted to build one, a circular one, with no break, just a complete circle, no contacts. I once saw a television programme where people were walking under the supergrid pylons with neon tubes and fluorescent tubes and getting them to light. And I wanted to see if this was true, so I tried it. Hey, then let's try those over there, because they're 440,000. Jeremy took his parents out into the fields near their local power station and waited for night to fall. As Jeremy had hoped, the electromagnetic field under the pylons was strong enough to excite the gases in the tubes. We tried it with the pylons, and I thought we'd try it in the lab with a high voltage source. Now I've got the Van de Graaff generator, which produces 750,000 volts. And uh, that, I'm going to try it with that. Lights, please. Well, that works. <coughs> That's all right. But it would be too dangerous to have this Van de Graaff. Uh, and it would be very expensive to have a Van de Graaff in your living room or in your loft. And it would be noisy as well. And there's a danger of the spark jumping on something that might catch fire and setting it to light. Now I thought we could experiment with radio waves to see if the tube would light from radio waves by actually transmitting to the tube. Here I've got a radio transmitter that operates on 144 megahertz. <coughs> I've got permission to use it. Normally I need a license for that frequency. Now let's see if it works. Yeah, it does work. I can light the fluorescent tube from radio waves. But there's one big disadvantage, and that's that the radio waves are going through the tube, but only a few. A lot of them are just being sprayed everywhere and wasted. This will be my most promising experiment. And here I've got a car ignition system. It produces a high voltage, feeds it along this cable, where it produces an electrical field around the hooks. This electrical field will make the gas in the tube glow. Uh, these hooks could be made of glass, so as not to spoil the complete ring effect, which I'm after. Yeah. 
Well, the tubes may be a little dim as yet, but it's clear enough that Jeremy has a very bright future. So, Jeremy Scurchley from Derby is all set for single-handed combat with the three judges. Colin Blakemore to begin. Jeremy, you've made a very extensive study of light sources. Can you tell us a little bit about the, the history of, of lamps? Well, Edison um, was in America and he, he started the lamps, really. He got a... He tried it with a human hair inside a vacuum, in a vacuum, but that burnt out. And then he tried it with a piece of bamboo and it worked. He baked the bamboo to make it into carbon and it worked. And at the same time, in England, um, Swan... Um, I've forgotten his first name now, but um, Swan, he um, got, at the same time, um, a piece of thread, um, sign thread, in a vacuum, and he baked it and turned it to carbon, and that worked as well. In, in a tungsten light bulb, um, various brightnesses are achieved from the same mains voltage, aren't they, um, by varying the resistance of the wire, yeah. which varies the current that's drawn. How would you vary the brightness of your induction lamp? Well, I think um, a variable resistor or some form of dimming device um, attached to the supply <coughs> of the coil or plates, but I'm using a crystal at the moment. Well, I'm going to use a crystal to operate it. But I think the gas, the pressure in the tube as well, would vary the brightness. What kind of crystal? Uh, uh, a piezoelectric there? crystal being bent by a form of uh, some motor. What's, what, what is that? What is the piezoelectric effect? Well, you <coughs> if you have a small piece of crystal and twist it along its z-axis, you can get a very, very high voltage, up to 30,000 volts, just produced across the crystal. Jeremy, what is the minimum voltage that you need to operate your lamp? About four to 5,000 volts. Uh, is this uh, not rather dangerous in the home? <coughs> No, with a piezoelectric crystal, it would be perfectly safe. You could put your finger on it, you could lick it, you could do what you like. Because the piezoelectric crystal, the amperage is very low. And in a standard television set, the boost diode produces over 25,000 volts, which young children might go messing about and prodding things in the back. Well, I rather hope not. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a lot of voltage. Are your lamps efficient in luminous terms? Uh, yes, I think so. I think there will be, yes. The ones that are produced at the moment are fairly dim, but the, if you increase the pressure, the brightness is increased, and I can make them very efficient, sure, by increasing the pressure. And what determines the choice of the gas in a, in a tube lamp? Well, the gas... The gas really determines the colour and yeah. the wavelength, but the choice of the gas... Well, it depends what sort of colour rendering you want and because if you've got a neon gas in the tube it'll give a very red light and everything will seem red. You couldn't use air. To a terrific pressure and it'll give a blue light, it'll like an arc. Very good Jeremy, thank you very much. Thank you.